please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And stand with me once you're there for the reading of Scripture. Let's read from verse 7 to verse 18. Before we do, let me just give you a moment of silence to posture your heart before God to receive whatever gift he has for you. Verse seven. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory as it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains where the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Take a seat. Last week I told you the story of Mother Teresa when she was on 60 Minutes. And the moment in the interview when Dan Rather asked her, when you pray to God, what do you say? And she was quiet, and then she said, I don't say anything, I listen. But I left the story unfinished. There, if you watch the interview, there's an awkward silence right there where he's more than a little thrown off. And he you know, kind of regains his composure and says, okay then, when you pray to God, What does he say to you? And she's quiet again for a minute. And then she said, he doesn't say anything. He listens. (laughs) And he is very thrown off at that point. You could just see it on his professional demeanor is like thrown for a minute. And then before he can say anything in reply, she cuts in and says, and I'm just so sorry, but if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Mother Teresa was referring to a type of prayer that goes beyond speaking to God or even listening to God to what St. John of the Cross once called silent love. Just simple presence to God, receiving his love into the depth of your being and giving it back in worship. Over the last three weeks, we've covered three stages of prayer, talking to God or praying pre-made prayers like the Lord's Prayer or the Psalms or liturgy, talking with God, praying your own life to God in gratitude and lament and petition and intercession. And then last week was listening to God or learning to hear God's voice. Now we come to the final stage, being with God 
to reiterate, these are not linear stages and that you never mature beyond one. For example, you never mature beyond the need to say thank you to God and to posture your heart in gratitude or to ask God for help for yourself in petition or others in intercession. In fact, the more you mature, the more you realize how much all of life is gift and just how desperately you need God. Just like an NBA point guard never matures beyond dribbling or a rock god never matures beyond practicing his guitar. My son yesterday ran into Dave Grohl on the street. And he's like, hey, are you Dave Grohl? And he's like, yeah, man, I'm Dave Grohl. <laughs> and I'm guessing that he still is doing his daily practice of the guitar. But there is a quasi-linear progression you know, music, you start by learning basic chords and basic music theory, and then you start by practicing the scales on your guitar. And then eventually, you're, you know, you're slain on stage or whatever it is. There's a long journey in between. But the farther we progress in prayer, and all I mean by that is in our life with God, the more we desire, we find ourselves desiring by the Spirit to talk with God, yes, to listen to God, yes, but even more to just be with God. As a general rule in relationships of all kinds with God or anyone, you can gauge the level of intimacy in that relationship by how comfortable you are being together in silence. Early on, relationships are full of a lot of words and activity, and that's good. But as you go closer to someone, you continue to talk and do things together and plan and play, but you are more at ease in each other's company. And you love to just be together, whether that's with a friend or a family member or a lover. All human analogies fall short here, but in marriage there is a level of intimacy that is literally the intermingling of persons at the deepest level that is wordless, that is really thoughtless and yet is deeply loving. And Christian contemplatives for thousands of years have long said that marital union is an icon. It's a, it's a symbolic window into the reality of union with God. And I'm sure whether that language is familiar to you or not, I'm sure that many of you in the room today ache for this union with God, ache for an experience of the love of God, not just a sermon about it or a book about it, but an experience of God loving you through Christ and by the Spirit. How do we move toward union, move toward and experience the love of God? The short answer is through prayer. And this type of prayer that I'm referring to by just being with God has come to be called contemplation, which is language that comes straight out of the New Testament itself. Uh, this is one prime example, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, let's look at it again just for a few minutes. This is a very hard passage to drop into because, as you noticed, it is dense and complex. But in a glance, the passage is a compare and contrast between the Old Covenant, or another name for that is Testament. If you're familiar with the story of the Bible, God's old kind of way of being with the people of Israel prior to Jesus. And the New Covenant, the New Testament, God's new way of being through Jesus with his new Jew plus Gentile family that we call the church. It's a compare and contrast between Moses and Jesus, between the law or the Torah and the spirit between an era where God's presence was in a cloud up on Mount Sinai over the tabernacle or the temple and one person and one person only Moses had access to God's presence and an era where now God's presence is in our mind and our body and our community together and all of us who have been baptized into Christ have now have the same access that Moses did to the presence of God by the spirit. 
And the writer Paul's basic case is that the new covenant is much better than the old. Not because the old was bad, but because it was for a time to hold Israel, the people of God, over until the coming of Jesus. And now all of us can, in turn, follow Moses' sixth example. If you're familiar with the story where Moses would go into the Holy of Holies, this inner room in the tabernacle where God's presence, the locus of God's presence was, and he would stand face to face with God and his face would begin to radiate or to glow in the story and he would have to wear a veil after when he would come out. Now all of us can do something like that and turn to face God in prayer. And let me just draw your attention to the climax of Paul's kind of passage here in verse 18. Let's just work through it line by line. He writes, and we all, so this is all of us, he's referring not to all humans, but to all of those who've been baptized into Christ, all of those in the community of Jesus, who with unveiled faces, and the imagery here is a mix of, imagine if Moses had no veil, and of a bride on her wedding night, unveiling her face in intimate love, as we contemplate the Lord's glory. Now the word there that's translated contemplate is katotrizo in Greek, and it literally means to gaze at or to direct the inner gaze of your heart at. God's glory. Now glory in the New Testament uh, means something a little different than in modern usage. I think of like the country music awards or the Grammys where inevitably somebody says all glory to God about their like song about a one night stand or whatever. I I don't think you know what that means, bro. Um, But that's not what glory means in the New Testament, the library of scripture. It, the best grasp I can give you in a short version is glory was the one word moniker for God's presence in the cloud under the old covenant over the tabernacle. And with God's presence, his beauty and his goodness. So as we contemplate the Lord's glory, meaning the Lord's presence and his beauty and his goodness, Paul seems to be saying it's doing something to us. Next line, we are being transformed, present tense, into his image. The word that's translated transformed is metamorpho in Greek. And one lexicon defines it as the ch- to change the essential form or nature of something. So it's where we get the word uh, metamorphosis, the word for how a caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly. Not a minor change, not a minor tweak, but a radical overhaul of the essential nature of someone or something. That is the word used by Paul for the type of change that is possible for you and for me by the Spirit of God. It's an ongoing process though. He writes, we are being transformed, not a one-time event, with, next line, ever increasing glory, meaning just a little bit at a time. It's incremental and it's way slower than any of us want, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Meaning this transformation at the core of our being into a whole new type of person and community doesn't come from us or from our willpower, hearing a sermon about it and let's go work really hard to do it, but from the Spirit's power welling up inside. To summarize, Paul is saying as we contemplate God, as we gaze at God, as we direct the inner view of our heart to the goodness and the beauty of who God is, we are transformed the deepest level of our essence into people who are like God. Now the practice of this has come to be called contemplation or contemplative prayer. And there are three basic, that word kind of means different things at different moments in church history and I'm not gonna nerd, I'm gonna discipline myself to not nerd out on you, all right? That's my, my version of love, okay? <laughs> Not doing a 10 minute rant about things that three of you care about. But there are three basic dimensions to contemplative prayer. Looking, yielding, and resting. A short word on each. The first is looking at God, looking at you in love. The Presbyterian spiritual director, Marjorie Thompson, tells this beautiful story about an elderly farmer, peasant farmer in Europe who would walk into this Catholic church every day and just sit there for hours in the quiet. 
And at one point, the priest asked this elderly man, what are you doing in here for all of these hours on end? And the old man just said, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. That's contemplative prayer. That's contemplation. Just looking at God, looking at you, just gazing at the beauty of ultimate love being poured into your heart by Christ and by the Spirit. Older generations called contemplative prayer beholding prayer, kind of another language for the same idea. Because in it we behold, we just kind of gaze and wonder at the beauty of who God is. I was up in Santa Barbara the last day or two camping with a bunch of friends and there were moments we were camping right in these kind of old growth sycamores that were gigantic gigantic and somehow have escaped fire in California. And there were multiple moments where I found myself just beholding the sycamore tree. You know that feeling when you just look at it and you're like, I can't run past this or I need to just stare at the beauty and the majesty of this or the ocean or the mountains. Just there's times when you behold beauty and your heart is just... Ah, captivated, but how easy is it to pass by that staggering level of beauty all of the time and be like, wow, nice tree. So I was saying, da 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 da, and you're like listening to politics on the news and just mad at the world when there's beauty all around you. To behold God is to do what many of us do when we're backpacking or hiking or at the ocean or before a piece of art in a museum. It's just to do that with the beauty of who God is. And this is the essence of Christian spirituality, of faith. A.W. Tozer once said this, faith is not a once done act, but a continuous gaze of the heart at the triune God. Believing then is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. At first, this may be difficult, but it becomes easier as we look steadily at his wondrous person, quietly, without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief excursion away from him, the attention will return again and rest upon him like a wandering bird coming back to its window. Of course, this raises the question, how do we look at a God who is invisible? Saint Bonaventure, a medieval intellectual and monk, said we each have three eyes. This is a medieval category, so it will not ring true to you, but I think there's much truth in it. He said we have the eye of the body by which we see the world around us. We have the eye of the mind by which we see the world within us, ideas, concepts, plans, dreams, desires. And then we have the eye of the heart by which we see God. And he said, by by which we see one another. As the Eastern Saint Theophan the Recluse once put it, by the way, coolest name of all time. Why do I have to be a Protestant? Why can't I get a name like that? It's so not cool. He said this, to pray is to descend with the mind into the heart and there to stand before the face of the Lord, ever present, all seen within you. Saint John of the cross just said, in this type of prayer, we remain in loving attention on God. Simone Weil, the French intellectual said, attention taken to the highest degree is the same thing as prayer. And this is the most basic aspect of contemplation, loving attention on our Father and on his love and compassion and goodness coming toward us in Christ and by the Spirit. Secondly, it's yielding to his love. There is a type of prayer where you're trying to change what is, petition and intercession, and that is good and necessary. But there's another type of prayer where you are not trying to change what is, but to accept and surrender to what is or what God would have. Think of Jesus in Gethsemane. He begins by praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. He's trying to change the circumstances of his life. 
But he ends by praying what? Not my will, but yours be done. This, this yielding, this letting go of outcomes, the surrender of the ego and our plans and our futile attempts at control, and just yielding our will to God's presence and his purposes is at the heart of contemplative prayer. The late professor Robert Mulholland of Asbury said this, the deep inner, or, I'm sorry, defined contemplation as this, the deep inner posture of a joyful release of our life and being to God in absolute trust without demands, without conditions, without reservation. It is neither a passive resignation nor a fatalistic acquiescence to whatever comes. It is rather a consistent posture of actively turning our whole being to God so that God's presence, purpose, and power can be released through our lives into all situations. It's just, God, here I am. Not my will, but yours be done. And finally, it is resting in God's love. There is a type of prayer that feels like work. And there is a type that feels more like rest. Asking, whether it's in the form of petition or intercession, feels more like work because it is work. In prayer, we are, that's one way to like frame what prayer is. In petition, in intercession, we are co-laboring with God to bring his kingdom to birth in our life and our world, like a mother laboring in childbirth. For that reason, Orthodox Jews forbid all intercessory prayer on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, you do not ask God to do anything. You thank God for what he has already done. Contemplative prayer feels less like work and more like rest, more like a portable Sabbath. That's why it feels very different from the first three stages or dimensions of prayer. In classical spirituality, which is kind of from the Middle Ages, contemplation is a stage in the spiritual journey. And in that framework, it's a work of grace, meaning if you were to ask a contemplative from 1305 or whatever, how do you like pray contemplatively? They would say, you don't do it at all. You wait and it is a gift that comes to you in God's time. We can't control it or make it happen. Ultimately, we just wait on God and we rest in his love. And that's mostly what prayer is, the medium by which we experience the love of God. It's how we experience the answer to Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. You may recognize this. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember Tozer's definition of faith, a continuous gaze of the heart on the Trinity. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Right, for those of you in the neuroscience kick, it's like implicit knowledge, not just explicit knowledge, gut knowing, not just head knowing, relational, experiential, and Paul's anything but anti-intellectual, he's brilliant. But he's saying we have to go beyond reading books and hearing sermons and thinking thoughts and positive mental hygiene. You have to know the love of God in your belly that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Contemplation or beholding or what being with God, whatever you want to call it, is how we are filled to the measure of the fullness of God. In the modern world, and in particular in a city like LA, where so many of us live in a state of chronic fatigue from our performance-oriented culture, posturing, angling, imaging, branding, marketing ourselves to the world. This type of prayer, just resting in and receiving the gift of God's love for us. Receiving our identity, not as what we do or what other people think of us or what we have, but just in who we are loved by, 
well-loved sons and daughters of the Father, and then just offering that love back in worship. This prayer is a lifeline to sanity and joy in a crazy and distressing time. It comes as no surprise that in Paul's framework for spiritual formation, contemplation is at the crux of how we are formed into people of love. And this makes perfect sense. There's a Singaporean writer named Hui Hui Tan who has this beautiful line, you are what your mind looks at, you are what you contemplate. I mean, if you think about that, people who spend hours every day reading political news, are they like kind, compassionate, <laughs> open-minded, non, you know, <laughs> herd-minded people? No, they tend to become angry and political and radicalized by ideology on whatever side, small-minded, bigoted, and full of hate. People who spend hours every day scrolling on Instagram or X or TikTok tend to become angry and anxious and insecure. People who spend hours every day watching dirty TV tend to become lustful and compulsive and addictive. We become like whatever it is we gaze upon, whether it's a TV or the Trinity. Therefore, the yellow line down the middle of the pathway to becoming like Jesus is looking at Jesus. It's how God designed your brain and your central nervous system to grow and develop. You are, I know just enough science to be dangerous, but I read too many books. You, your brain is full of mere neurons that cause you to take on the properties of whoever or whatever you look at. When someone smiles at you, what do you tend to do? Smile? Okay, maybe you don't. <laughs> we need to work on that. It's, I'll come back soon, all right? Uh, when somebody smiles at you, you tend to smile back. When somebody frowns at you, I gotta tell you the story, the best story. I don't know I should tell the story because what if the person's here? I was, I'm, I'm at dinner a couple nights ago, sitting outside, glorying, moving from the Pacific Northwest to California where in November you eat dinner outside. It's just like <laughs> over the top with fish tacos, right? And this gal walks past me, maybe, I don't know, mid thirties with a four or five year old. And she makes eye contact with me from about 10 feet away, kind of walking on the sidewalk and like stares at me. And then she starts going like this at me. Like, I don't recognize, I'm like, what have I done? And what, what, what have I said? What have I, I'm like, my, my nervous system goes up and she just doesn't break eye contact as she's walking past and she just says, never have children eye contact for like three more feet and then goes off. It's like, where were you 18 years ago? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <sighs> but when somebody glares at you, I mean, what do you, I, I literally went, <gasps> I went like that. You know, my body, I was, I was like, ah, oh, what have I done? You know? Oh, these, this part of our brain, right? What has she been gazing at? I, oh man, Lord have mercy on her. And we've all been there by the way. And some of us kept our thoughts to ourselves, but um, <laughs> this is how we're wired. The neuroscientist Andrew Newberg, who has this beautiful little book, How God Changes Your Brain. He's not a Christian, but he's very friendly to in particular Christian contemplative prayer. He writes, if you contemplate God long enough, something surprising happens in the brain. Neural functioning begins to change. We have a nervous system that actively participates in its own neural construction, something we do not see in other animal brains. Called, this is called neuroplasticity, or just the ability for your brain to develop based on what you put your attention toward. Basically, there's a little part of our brain called the anterior cingulate that sits between our limbic and our prefrontal structure. And when it's stimulated, it decreases our impulses of anger and fear and increases our feelings of compassion. When we meditate or contemplate on God's, God and his love coming toward us in Christ, it stimulates this part of our brain. And he writes, it, quote, appears to strengthen the same neurological circuits that allow us to feel compassion toward others 
Translation, when we think on the love of God coming toward us, it literally rewires the neural circuits in our brain and makes us into more loving and compassionate people. By the way, the opposite is also true. He writes, if your view of God is of an angry authoritarian tyrant in the sky, that also changes your brain. And Newberg argues it has a similar effect on your brain to PTSD. Changes your brain to make you more fearful and aggressive. The Anglican Bishop William Temple once observed that if people have a wrong view of God, the more religious they become, the worse they become. Until eventually, he said, it would have been better for them to have been atheists. This it is why it is incredibly important to think Christianly or Christianly about God. And never forget what another Anglican, Michael Ramsey, once said, that God is Christ-like and in him is no unchristlikeness at all. But just this, looking at Christ, looking at you, is the core of transformation. It is written in Psalm 34, those who look to him are radiant. As we look at God's beauty, we become more beautiful. As we look at the joy inside the Trinity, we become more joyful. As we look at the serenity inside God, we become more and more calm and peaceful as we are enveloped into the peace at the heart of God. This is the gift of contemplative prayer. And contemplative prayer is not just for monks and nuns and introverts like myself and Mother Teresa, not to put myself in the same sentence. (laughs) Anyone can, and I would argue, should pray in a contemplative manner. But that's not to say it's easy. Anyone can do this, but it is hard. You will face, I'm, I'm all about spiritual realism, so to a fault. I just need to warn you, you will face at least three major challenges. And this is not to scare you away, but it's to prepare you to practice this coming week if you so choose. The first challenge you will face is distraction. The moment you begin to sit in loving attention on God without words or maybe even without thoughts, your brain will start to jump all over the place. One minute you're contemplating the Trinity. The next moment you're like, I need to wash my car. Where is this? I just moved to LA. I don't even know where to wash my car. It's really stressful, blah, blah, blah. Californians get their car washed. Who has that much money? Not me. Where's that? Like then, oh, God, I come back to you in love. By the way, that's like this morning. That was just narrating to you my experience two hours ago. Distraction does not mean that you're bad at prayer. It means you are a human being being with a... with a mind and a brain. The mind is by nature jumpy and distractible. This is a normal and natural part of your brain's inner workings. And while it can be calmed and quieted over time with dedicated practice, distraction will never go away. And in seasons of stress, most of you know the science, like that's your brain scanning for threats. And so the more stressed you are, the more distractible you will be. In seasons of stress that all of us inevitably go through, it will overcome the best of us, no matter your commitment to prayer. The key to quieting distractions is to not give them a second thought, literally. When they come, not if they come, when they come, just bring your mind back to God. Just let it go. You don't need to judge it. You don't need to beat yourself up. You don't need more commentary on your bad commentary, more thoughts on your errant thoughts. Just... Come back to God. Thomas Keating, whose book, Open Heart, Open Mind, is the seminal work on what he would call centering prayer, a form of contemplation, writes about how if your mind gets distracted a thousand times in 10 minutes of prayer, that's a thousand chances to come back to God. Come back to God. Come back to his mercy. Come, I mean, have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody that can only pay attention to you for about four seconds at a time? I would feel annoyance. But when you come back to God, you experience love. Every distraction is a chance to again experience the love of God. Secondly, we have to face the challenge of hurry. To be with God in this way, you must, as the philosopher Dallas Willard once said, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. 
But to do this will make you and I confront our impatience and how quickly we get bored in prayer and in life. Henry Nouwen once called prayer wasting time on God. And he did not mean that prayer is a waste of time, far from it. He meant that in our productivity-obsessed culture, where time is money and money is God, where entertainment and stimulation fill every crevice of our days, to give God your time and your loving attention for him to do or not do whatever he pleases, it's wasteful in the eyes of our culture. This type of prayer just takes time. I wish there's a part of every pastor that wants to make discipleship sound really easy and doable, but that is just not true. I mean, there are easy and doable things and start there, but it just gets harder and harder and harder and more and more cruciform and more and more beautiful and deeper and richer and more rewarding but the promise of Jesus was never follow me to an easy life. It was follow me to the cross and on the other side is new life. And I wish I could say you can do this in 30 seconds. You can have it stack three minutes a day, but the reality is most of our brains take a while just to settle. This way of being with God is not quick. It is not efficient. It is not productive, and it is a glimpse of eternity in time. Never forget, the main thing we get out of prayer is not answered prayer. It's not even good mental hygiene. That's all a gift. It is God himself. Finally, the third challenge we face is our inner turmoil. Whatever is in us will come up to the surface in prayer. Anxiety, love, hate, vengeance, unforgiveness, wounding, bitterness, whatever is down there will come up here into our field of awareness. Thomas Keating said the first thing that happens when you attempt to pray in this way and you come to quiet before God is what he called the unloading of the unconscious. Like in his, in his paradigm, all of this undigested emotional pain and trauma of a lifetime or a slight from a coworker two days ago, it comes up in order for your body to, in a healthy way, process and discharge it to God in prayer. But this process means that often contemplative prayer feels just like, coming up at first. And as we pray this way, we begin to realize all the ways that we've used hurry and distraction and noise and work and stimulation and even the Bible and church activity to run away from the healing of God deep within our soul. Whatever is in you, deep will come up from you. And this is scary for a lot of people, and I have no judgment at all. But if you can have the courage to face whatever is down in the shadow under the loving gaze of God, you will begin to realize it's healing that we're scared of. And God will slowly but surely, not in a 20 minute session tomorrow morning, not in a zap from heaven, evacuate the pain out of your heart and begin to heal you at the deepest level. People, you will notice, who spend a lot of time in prayer with God this way, they are not perfect, but they tend to become, over many years, very happy and calm. Therefore, in light of all of these challenges, and there are more, you will quickly realize that to pray in a contemplative manner, you have to adopt a a contemplative lifestyle. As a general rule, how we are outside of prayer is how we are inside of prayer. One way of thinking about discipleship to Jesus in the modern era is about slowing your life down to pray. If you hear me say nothing else the last few weeks, let this be an invitation to you to slow your life down in with your job and your family and your responsibilities. I get the realism of life, but to a more prayerful, more contemplative pace with the end goal of praying without ceasing, of just being with God all day long. We have come to the end of our four weeks together. 
We only have one exercise for you in this final week. And again, it's all invitational. The exercise that's in your guide is to begin your daily prayer rhythm with silence and a breath prayer. Whether you pray in the morning or at night or in the middle of the day or all three, the practice is just to pause for a few minutes, set a timer if you want, whatever works for you, and just sit in God's love. There's one way to do this. That's an ancient type of prayer called the breath prayer, where you just kind of tie your prayer to your breathing. You just slow yourself down. You begin to breathe deeply from the belly, trying to be present to your breath, present to the moment, not thinking about the past or the future, but just present to God deep within you. You may want to use a prayer word or a prayer phrase like Father or come Holy Spirit or a line from scripture. Again, there's no right way to do this. In the beginning, if you do this for 60 seconds to two minutes, you should feel fantastic. If you do this at 10 minutes, you are the Dave Grohl of prayer right there. Well done. (laughs) Most people find it helpful to use some kind of a prayer word or image, just something to slow you down to the pace of God. There's also a reach exercise in your guide and a beautiful video tutorial from a friend of mine in New Zealand on beholding prayer. If you want to really to attempt a deeper form of contemplative prayer, that's available for you. To end our time together, let me just say again, prayer is not a technique. Yes, there is technique to it. Breathe, say this, invite the Holy Spirit. But technique is for us, it's not for God. Prayer is the medium through which we open to the love of God. And the most important discipline of prayer is just to show up every single day for whatever time you have and just make yourself available to the Spirit of God to transform you. Through all the highs and lows along the way and over a long period of time, the lifelong journey of formation, I'm coming off a a pretty hard week, honestly. We just moved to LA three months ago. Moving is not fun. I've not really done it before. And moving with three teenagers to a new city and a new community, it's actually going pretty well. But man, I think it all came to a head this week. And I think every one of our five-member family had a fight with the other at some level. And there were some bad moments. And so last night, I'm, you know, editing this sermon on how you are transformed into a person (laughs) of love as I'm like repenting of my sin of lingering resentment at a particular family member over a thing that happened Wednesday night. Um, And it's just, oh gosh, you know, what a hypocrite. It's the worst feeling when you were a preacher and you're like, this stuff is true, but, but me, ah. And waking up this morning, again, with that glorious extra hour, making a cup of coffee, sitting in the quiet of my living room, watching the sun rise and just saying, God, here I am. All of my brokenness, the ways I hurt the people I love the most, the ways I'm unkind and selfish, fear-based, controlling, the mistakes I make as a dad, as a husband. And in that moment, there was no lightning bolt from heaven this morning that was like, bam, there you are, sainthood but there was a quiet welling up of love at the base of my soul to buoy me into another day. This is the promise and possibility of life with God. And I will do that again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next. What's the line in AA that they say at the end of the meeting? Keep coming back, it works. So keep coming back to God, to his love, to prayer, to quiet. When your mind is all over the place, when you sit there for 20 minutes and you had max 20 seconds of loving attention on God, just keep coming back, back to the love of God, back to the mercy of God, back to the spirit of God. Never let a day go by. Keep coming back. It works. Let's stand together and pray. I don't want to say any more words. I just, before we begin to sing 
and invite you forward for prayer. I just want to give you a moment. And do not judge yourself if you don't feel a thing or you can't focus your mind. It's total, just means you're human. But I just want to give you a minute to just rest, to Sabbath in the love of God for you in Christ by the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit.